So I'm Adele Patrick and I'm the Creative Development Manager here at Glasgow Women's Library. Right, so the Women's Library um, aims to do two key things. One is to ensure that the hidden histories of women's contributions to not just Glasgow but Scottish culture are spotlit, they're preserved, they're recorded. Uh, but at the same time, we also try and be a space where contemporary women's creative and cultural lives can be fostered and developed. In a nutshell, uh, the announcement that Glasgow is going to be City of Culture, I suppose, was a catalyst for the start of what would become the Women's Library. So, this idea of Glasgow presenting itself to the world in, in a regenerating way, I think, made us think that unless we did something as women, that it was likely to be not a sort of really plural representation of Glasgow's culture, not just foregrounding guys, but also foregrounding white guys, you know, and I think we thought that it would be good to seize the moment and do something during 1990 that showcased women's creative and cultural contributions. So that was the origin and we, we were visited around that time by um, women's libraries and archives from Europe. And I think that really sowed the seed that we'd, we felt like we'd discovered that there was a real appetite for having a, a space or a place where women's work could be seen and shown and collected. So um, myself and a few other women who were around at the time visited some of these women's libraries and we just came back to Glasgow in sort of nine, end of 1990, early 91 and thought we're going to do it, you know, we're going to set up a space. We uh, underwent loads and loads of scepticism about our work and, um, you know, from jokey things about, you know, that being a sexist setup, and but also sort of like the idea that is it really needed, you know, hasn't feminism done its work and so on and so forth. So, and I must say that still occasionally I get that type of response, but. Um, I'm astonished that we don't get more. I think the, from my memory, um, there's certainly a massive amount of work to be done and a lot of campaigning around and a lot of energy around the violence against women. Um, sort of, the, almost like the the array of different ways that that was being understood. You know, the idea that coercive control was a significant thing. It's not long after the, the criminalization of rape and marriage. I mean, it's just unbelievably recent where men could feel entitled to rape um, their wives in the domestic space and there was absolutely no recourse to getting support from the law by women. Um, so it, that was an incredibly important thing. We were trying to do our best to provide a complementary space really to the agencies that were focused on supporting survivors of violence. And it was a period really in the 90s where um, the politicians could Understanding Glasgow, they did understand violence against women. There was, st there was the start of women who had feminist views and ideas actually getting into positions within the council and getting into teaching and getting into the armed forces and getting into um, the police and law and so on and so forth. So you're actually seeing the starts of the changes that we're seeing come into fruition now where feminism really started impacting on the infrastructure really and in, in, in the council. If you look at the logo of the Women's Library which is like a circle, it's almost like a, a road sign and it's got a woman that's like this generic woman that you often see, um, you know like 
a man at work sign but it's been adapted a little bit and an, an eye and um, it's not a, not a strong graphic thing but um, I designed that and it was part of a discussion that we were having about how can we signal what we do in a way that doesn't anticipate somebody's ethnicity. We want it to be accessible even to women who uh, are not confident readers, um, who are, can understand the idea of woman and information and that that will be an access point for them. And then it's our job to make it relevant to them. But we don't want to discriminate. I suppose we could have made it something that's a bit more accessible in terms of signaling to women with disabilities, but we thought that that woman's symbol or a figure of a woman um, and the eye would be a sort of non-judging and non-specific as possible to enable the widest array of, of ownership and I do think that throughout our history we've tried to ensure that women of colour that women with different identities women very different sexualities different ages different backgrounds use our space and it's an evolving environment you know so obviously over the last few years um, more trans women using the, um, the library and making it their own and volunteering and, and shaping the way that the collection has developed. Um, I think class is a very very big issue um, in resources like our own and in museums and, and galleries it feels like this, the, the movement there in terms of access is really going far too slowly. So some of the things that have been constant maybe over the last 20 years or so, we do one-to-one um, -one literacy in, in the library, which is a really critical thing and I think that I'm pointing these things out because it's very unusual for a museum, library or archive to have a full-time literacy worker and uh, another, another tutor actually that works with women who need support in developing their confidence in reading and writing. Uh, we have ESOL classes here as well so that's for women who don't have English as a first language. We I've obviously got lots of activities around the collections, so the collections are enormous. I think, I think it's something like 200,000 archive items, over 20,000 books in our London collection, and some, between three and 5,000 museum objects. So it's a big collection, and so there's lots of programmes that are associated with, with that and lots of opportunities for people to get involved and in contributing to the collection, interpreting it, uh, learning more about what a collection is, you know, and, and what it can be for them. We obviously have loads of events. Um, we have lots of festivals, we have lots of film screenings, we have uh, heritage walks. Um, we do research, we've just published an amazing piece of research that's about inequalities in the museum sector. Um, so we do do lots of different things. And people don't appreciate as well that they might have made history. They might have been involved in a campaign to address a housing issue in their area or there might have been people who, uh, you know, family might have a great aunt who was involved in the munitions thing, or they might, you know. And w we value the items that are given to us that record all the ways that women have changed the world, whether that is by being fearless, a fearless mum, or a, you know, a remarkable aunt, or, you know, all the different ways that the mosaic of women in a city like this have brought about change. Um, I think this may be one milestone that I think was really um, important for us and that was sort of getting the recognised collection of national significance. I think 
for feminist organisations and equalities based organisations, um, realising that you have a collection that is unique and is seen as significant in a national setting is a remarkable thing and it doesn't happen very often. I think we're the only organisation of our kind like that in Scotland and I do feel proud of that because I think that it's as a result of thousands and thousands and thousands of donors and thousands of women contributing their time and energy to the collection. I think that type of validation is really important to those who created the Women's Library. I think it's massively important that we're here in Glasgow. I think, you know, why has it not happened anywhere? Literally yesterday I was talking to somebody who was saying, why is there not one in Edinburgh? And this raises its head periodically and I think, brilliant, go for it. There's nothing to stop another library, another women's library germinating. But I think at the outset it was because of Glasgow being quite a masculinised city. It was very much about the Red Clyde side, it was very much about post-industrial, it was about um, within a socialist, communist leaning uh, political landscape, very many women being told the principal thing that we need to do is to get, you know, address class issues and the feminist stuff comes later. That's a luxury we can't afford. Right. What better place could you be doing something in where, um, or creating an organisation like this where you've got a whole city that I think is kind and positive and creative and knowledgeable and feels strongly about history and feel strongly about their neighbourhood and feel proud to be Glaswegians. And that if you say you're Glasgow Women's Library, even people who are a bit misogynist are probably happy that you're there. You know what I mean? Certainly happy to know that we're the only one in, in the UK. I, I, I do agree. I think that having a, a physical space is absolutely still paramount, no, notwithstanding the fact that I love the digital and the digital is a, an absolutely incredible asset to any movements for change. It's still critically important for people to meet each other and for people to handle materials and get that sense when you look at a badge that might have been made in the first wave or, or look at the records of what the suffragettes achieved or whatever. I still think it gives you a certain sort of palpable rush of how change was wrought by women like ourselves.